it's time for the big conversations telling stories of movers and shakers of industry giants and daring professionals it's time for the conversations that change your perspective on life the kind of conversations that shape entrepreneurs and move careers forward if you don't know where these conversations are found we are sending you a gps but if you're listening to this voice right now you are here Welcome to the Growth Podcast. This is the GPS. All right, welcome to episode 33 um, of the Growth Podcast. We're happy to have you um, on the podcast uh, today, celebrating 20,000 subscribers. Thank you very much for all of you that have subscribed. Um, I hope you keep telling your friends. Um, I get a lot of people that send me photos of them watching um, on TV because they connect their TV to the internet with smart TVs and everything. Um, and that's the kind of support um, that we like. And the conversation still continue. And we're having one um, other interesting conversation uh, today. Um, we're talking to the country senior partner for PWC Zambia. Most of you do know him, especially if you're on a platform like this one. Um, you know who my guest is. I'm talking about uh, Mr. Andrew Chibuye. Welcome to the Growth Podcast. Thank you very much, Sui. Thanks for having me. It's good to, to be with you. Yeah, it's good to have you. Good to have you. Um, you you are... You are like the, the the dream professional, you know. I, feel like <laughs> I don't know what you mean. No, as in like, you know, I think for, for most people who are in the professional space, you know, uh -huh. they want to be, you know, an Andrew, you know. Uh -huh. I want to, you know. Because I saw, I think the last time, um, the last conversation I think we had, people yeah. were saying, no, your, your career was, it, it grew too fast, you know. like it it, too fast. Uh -huh. Like it, 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 you succeeded very fast, you know, like yeah. how did you get there and whatnot. So those are conversations we'll be going into. Yeah. But I'll ask you a question. Yeah. What job, no matter how well paying it is, no matter how broke you were, would you never take? Medical doctor. Or medical doctor? Never. You're scared of blood? I don't like it. So you don't like blood? No, no, no. And my sister is a medical doctor. And she's narrating what she's doing and what's giving her a thrill. And I'm just like, stop. <laughs> <laughs> but how, how do you respond to injections? That is fine. So I mean, injection. if, if, I, if I'm the patient, it's fine. But being the doctor on the other side, or like even like, I mean, anything in medicine is like pathology, what? Those things. No, no, no. no you, you can never. Like, uh, you know, like even like when you're, you're watching a movie and it's it's gory stuff. No, it's not for me. <laughs> oh, I, I I watch medical. I, I think there's a, there's a series called The Good Doctor. I liked yeah. it, right? but I've got no passion for medicine. I, I watch it selectively. Oh, selectively. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like as and when there's no doctor. When you start too much seeing what's stuff. happening, uh, <laughs> you, you look the other way, start a conversation this side. So I probably wouldn't. I probably could have like done the, like, you know, like the get the basic qualifications, but it's also a calling, right? Yeah. So, so it's just not... Yeah, people are saying, because I saw, I think a few days ago, they were saying, no, doctors are going on ghost slow. Yeah. I thought it's a, it's a calling, it's not about money. <laughs> it gets you to make a living too, right? <laughs> exactly, you know. So it's, yeah. a, it's an interesting one. It's a balancing act. So. You you were you were uh, a captain at, at, at Pelembe. I was a house captain. Yeah. The house so captain. I was a senior prefect. Yeah. The senior prefect there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How was that like? It was good. I mean, um, I was, I never found myself on, I rarely found myself on the wrong side of, the law, quote unquote, you know what I mean. So, doing the right thing, very consistent, very disciplined. I think, um, obviously, people can make their own judgments. So, when I got to my final year, I mean, I was a class monitor throughout. So, you're making noise; it's me writing you down. <laughs> 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 then, when I got to my final year, I was a, I was one of the senior prefects. So, I used to look after uh, one of the the houses, one of the boarding houses with the, with the, with the boys in it. Um, so, yeah. So, but I think I was fairly, when I look back, I think I was probably a bit too extreme. Yeah. Because. Took the job too serious. Yeah. Very <laughs> serious. I, I mean, I used, to, I used to enforce the law very, 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 very seriously. Yeah. Do you think that kind of shaped who you became? Well, the discipline, yes. And, um, so you know, just that it's 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 in my nature to live a fairly not regimented but very prescriptive life. So get up at the same time, uh, do so follow a certain sequence. So I, I liked that naturally. So getting up early, getting people up, getting everyone in time to get out of the hostel and things like that. That was just my thing. Getting to to class early, 
uh, like prep, I, I laughed one time, like when I realized maybe I need to slow down a bit because our prep used to start at like 7 p.m., eh? 19 hours. So it was like 10 minutes before prep. And I was walk. so you would be given a, like if you, uh, there would be prefects assigned to each class, say the grade eight block, the grade nine block, there were four classes on each. A prefect assigned to each, and uh, there would, then there would be a senior prefect assigned to the whole block. So I was a senior prefect assigned to one of the blocks. And I was walking to class like 10 minutes before, and I saw the the kids scampering into class when they saw me. <laughs> I said, oh, okay, this is good and bad because they've still got 10 minutes, but anyway, it's fine. So I was that kind of that kind of a prefect. Okay. And 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 ultimately you then became um, you know, an accountant. You 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 refer a lot to your to your father, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um is he the reason you decided to go into accountancy? Yes, I'd say so. I mean he he was fairly open. So he told me, look, he didn't tell me to become an accountant. He rarely, if ever, said you should become this. Right? So there are four of us. Each of us did our own thing. My other brother's an engineer. I'm an accountant. My immediate young sister is a lawyer. Our last born is a medical doctor. Right. So each person did their own thing. What I really wanted to do, he said no. Okay. What was that? Nuclear science. There are no jobs in Zambia. <laughs> that sort of thing. Yeah? So he just told me, ah, my friend, eh? Just be serious, okay? So after that, so after I packed that aside, and I thought, okay, I really, I wanted to be an engineer, okay? So engineering and mechanical engineering, to be specific. But the issue at that time was that if you go to Unza, Unza would be closed sometimes for an undefined period. So guys were doing four-year courses, taking six years or seven years, things like that. So that's how I never pursued engineering. And then by process of elimination, then accounting was my third choice. So talk talked to my dad. Um, I finished school in, in December or November, whenever it was. Then there was, a, there, was a, there, was a, there was a group starting like the January. I said, do you want to go now? I said, no, give me six months. I want to rest after grade 12. You know, just make sure that this is what I do because... When I put my mind and say, okay, this is what I want to do, I don't want to do it in half measures. I want to do it and make sure that I do it properly. So I, re I took like six, six months off. Then after that, started at Zika's accounting, and here we are. Okay. And in, in, in 2003, you joined PwC. That's correct. Um, 18 years later, somewhere there, you the country senior partner. First of mm -hmm. all, why, why do you guys call it senior partner? Why don't you just call your CEO? It's the same thing, really. It's just that legally, a firm is a partnership, okay? So a firm is run by partners. We are, that's just how we, that's the, the nature of the organization that does what we do there. We've actually got two organizations. It's just people don't, we don't emphasize that there's a limited company as well. So depending on what we are doing, we do it either as partners or as directors, Okay. Okay. But that's that's there's there's a reason for that. Yeah. So if you're the most senior partner, then you're the country senior partner. But it's the same thing in some countries. You're country senior partner slash chief executive officer. It's really one and the same thing, to be honest. Okay. Our conversation today is guided by a number of stuff that I got off your social media. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and and some of it I think um, comes from maybe comments you didn't respond to. Okay. You know? Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and and also some of the lessons that you seek to share with your audience. Yeah. Because I've noticed that you know you're more um, you've positioned yourself as, as a thought leader. Yeah. You know I think people drink from that, your cup a lot. Your opinion. Me. Yeah. I just share thoughts. If I'm yeah. a thought leader, that's your opinion. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so you, there was one time you spoke about um, putting your best foot forward. Putting your best foot forward, yeah. Yeah. Um, how did that work for you um, in terms of your, your career? How would you say, okay, this is how I put my best foot forward at PwC? Because I know you did that because ultimately yeah. you then ended up mm -hmm. being country senior partner. How do you put your best foot forward? So for me, it's, it's a number of different things, eh? So first, it's about being clear about what are we trying to achieve, okay? So what are we trying to do? Whatever, even today, and it's the same, it's a scalable philosophy, right? From the person who's just joined the organization to the chief executive officer, right? Each of us has got a task 
or a role and a responsibility. So what is my role? What's my responsibility? What's the task? What's the activity? What are we trying to do? Then it's understanding how, how exactly are we going to go about this? And then it's saying, okay, so what is the expectation, all right? Because I think there's a, a big part of what we do is making sure you understand expectations. And what I'm talking about is irrespective of what level you're at in the organization, whether it's me dealing with a board chairperson or one of the team members dealing with a, a fellow clerk maybe at, at one of our clients, right? Then it's also asking the question, okay, so how do we define what added value is, no matter what it is that we're doing, all right? So how do we do it in such a way that either the experience for the person that I'm working with is something that um, is something that is positive, uh, is something that's enriching, is something that leaves them better than they were before because of that particular interaction, okay? So that's a very deliberate thought process that I try to apply. Then when you put all of that together, you say, okay, so when I do what I'm going to do, all right, when I look back, I want to be able to say, under the circumstances, with the information, the environment as it was, I think I did all that I could in that particular situation. Then I'm happy that I've put my best foot forward. So it's that sort of philosophy. I can't, I, there's always something that you can do better, yeah. but you look back and say, actually, I'm happy with what I did. Okay. And then also you you, you made a reference to, to to really applying oneself. Yeah. And this is something that uh, we've heard even outside, you know, um, of your social media, that you must apply yourself. Apply. Yeah. Yeah. What does it mean to apply yourself? And how would you distinguish that? Look, in this organization, I think that one's applying himself. That one isn't. Mm. A lot of it is about taking responsibility. Yeah. Um, it's about leadership. Okay. So maybe let's start with leadership, right? People define leadership in different ways. Okay. Uh, leaders make things happen, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But the most interesting definition I found of leadership came from uh, one of my mentors. And he told me leadership is about taking responsibility. Okay. Because to take responsibility doesn't need you to have a title, right? So you can be in an environment and something needs to get done. Whoever gets it done or whoever takes charge, irrespective of whether they are the person who has the title, the person who is supposed to do it, they have become the leader in that particular environment. So then you say, then I say to myself, okay, if I've got things that I need to do, and some of it I spoke about just a short while ago, then how do I do it in such a way that it becomes an enrich, enriching experience? How do I do it in such a way that when I look back, I say, I think I did the best that I could under the circumstances. It's about once I've thought through or seen what the end goal is, then putting in the effort, um, um, putting in the energy, the right attitude, so that when I look back, when anyone who is observing this particular situation looks, they say, yeah, I think this person has really, uh, they've, they've tried their level best. That's really what application or, or applying yourself is about. It's really taking responsibility and then at the end of the day, applying your energy, your attitude. And that this that's very broad in terms of what, what do we mean, attitude, etc. But it's really about looking back and saying, actually, this person has... Under the circumstances, they've done all they could. That's what I look forward to. Um, you, you, this year, ah, actually this year you're, you're celebrating 20 years at PwC, eh? 20 years. 20 years at, at PwC. Some people say uh, you shouldn't stay too long in an organization. What do you make of that? I think we're different. Eh? Uh, we've got different passions, different motivations different inspirations. So for me, when I decided that I wanted to become an accountant, because even becoming an accountant, you can be different different pathways, right? You become a chief executive, of, you can become a chief financial officer, you can go into practice and become like me. I'm, an, I'm trained as an auditor, so I'm an audit partner. And then also... Um, 
in our countries in your partner. But the thing about why I settled for what's called uh, public practice or being in the role that I'm is that it's extremely dynamic. No two days are the same, right? So when I look at my client portfolio, today I'll be dealing with a bank, tomorrow I'm dealing with a mine. I might even be doing exactly the same thing, but because I'm doing it in different industries, my learning is different, the people I'm interacting with are different, you're constantly um, thinking about what's happening in the environment around us. How does this affect my clients? You take it to them, you have a conversation, you understand what are they doing. It's constant learning. That's what I love about what I do. So yes, it's 20 years, but it's 20 years that no single year is the same. Every year is different. The networks you build are phenomenal. The sorts of people you get to interact with are incredible. And then there's, uh, because of the nature of firms, you know, we, people come, they go, they come, they go. Every year you are interacting with different people. Their motivations are different. You know, the generation, I mean, I've, I've been in the firm 20 years. I'm one of the longest serving. I'm probably even one of the oldest. So I'm having to adapt even my working style to deal with the, the people who are joining now. And, you know, it's, there's some point when you sit and think, wow, this person I'm interviewing, was maybe one or two years old when I started <laughs> started working. <laughs> you know those sorts of conversations. Yeah. So how do you adapt or uh, connect and engage with them? So it's a very dynamic environment, and that's why I love it, and that's why I've stayed. You you also do a lot with um um like like graduate trainees, if I call them that, exactly, that yeah. come straight from university and come join the organization. What do you see in these these youngsters? that tells you that, look, uh, this one is going far, this one isn't. Because I don't feel you have to spend a lot of time with someone to tell that this person yeah. is, yeah. What, what are those telltale signs that even though they haven't really kicked off their career per se, mm -hmm. but there's some things that you can notice in some of these youngsters that tells you, ah, no. And th th that's a very interesting one. It's two things, okay? It's the attitude and the aptitude, okay? The attitude and the aptitude. The attitude being the more dominant one, all right? So I'll give you an example. Just a sec. <coughs> okay. So I'll give you an example. In our organization, we don't just recruit accountants. Eh? So we recruit guys who are engineers, guys who studied forestry, um, you name it, right? And they come, but they're coming to a firm that's known as an accounting firm, okay? So how do you go about selecting the the right person right and we've come to the realization that it's uh it's misleading to believe that the only people who can make good accountants are the ones who are trained to be accountants okay so what you then do is you look at this person how do they conduct themselves and everyone has got whether you've worked or not you've got a cv you've got a narrative of what you've done or over the course of your life what problems you solved what challenges you've encountered and how you've overcome them, how you respond to different situations, especially challenges when they are thrown at you. And we get a sense of how, uh, it's very easy to get a sense this person is a problem solver. Problem solver doesn't mean you only solve work problems. You solve problems generally. You know? yeah. This person is a leader, all right? You don't need to be working to be a leader. You're a leader in your community, a leader in your family, a leader at school, etc. So we get a sense, you can get a sense of that. So the attitude is, is paramount, right? Because if someone's got the right attitude and then you supplement it now with aptitude and aptitude, in a large extent, it, it, to some extent, is sort of driven by, you know, your academics and whatever. But not everyone who is very intelligent has a strong academic record. Because life happens sometimes, right? Uh, not everyone has got the ability to go to the best schools. People encounter disruptions and things like that. So <coughs> it's also not <coughs> so it's also not uh, hundred percent accurate that only those who are who have on paper strong academic um, outcomes are best suited to what you're trying to do. So you have to, you have to actually go through a process, give people a chance, you see them, you understand them, you interrogate them, you test them, 
uh, and see what the outcomes are. And then from there, you pick them up. But overall, uh, if someone's got the right attitude, the right aptitude, we can teach them anything. And that's what we basically look for. Now, you you mentioned specifically, you know, the like the current generation. You see very, very clever, clever guys. Uh, the motivations are quite different, very, very passionate about things which perhaps is not 100% as you would perceive it to be work-related, right? So people have got causes they're passionate about. They've got, they're passionate that they want to be associated with an organization that has a purpose, an organization that's concerned about things like the environment, about diversity, um, about making the community better, not just uh, making money or, or having a strong brand. Uh, in this case, whether you can even sustain that brand aside from having... A, a strong purpose is actually questionable. So it's that sort of um, an environment. So it's been evolving and it continues to evolve, but that's what makes it exciting because you have to understand, adapt, and move. Uh, I, I was talking to someone uh, yesterday. Uh, they left their job, so now they're, they're job hunting, and they told me, I, I, I'm, I, I want a job similar to the one I had, mm -hmm. where, yes, it's work, but we're actually having impact on the community. Yeah, yeah, like, oh, yeah. we are taking people yeah, back to yeah. school. Where that, yeah. yes, I want the money, but that, I also want, you know, that. Because mm. no matter how tiring I am, the idea that our work is, is impacting Impactful. people's lives mm. keeps me going. Yeah. I ask you, how busy are you? How busy I'm not are you? busy. I never, you know, this is an interesting one. I'm never busy. I'm just doing something. I'm just occupied with something. And let me, uh, let me explain what I mean, right? So people always tell me, oh, you, you, you're doing a lot, what you, uh, you're, you're so busy, right? So look, at the end of the day, each of us, the Lord has given us 24 hours. And I'll tell you why I actually find it uncomfortable to say I'm busy. So if you come to me, Sue, and you tell me I'm busy, I feel it sort of uh, reflects on my perception of your own time and what you need to do. Everyone has got has got something that they need to do, right? Yeah. So when I say I'm busy, I feel as though I'm putting across that what I'm doing is more important than yours, right? So what I say instead is, look, I'm doing something, right? So if someone wants a bit of my time, all you have to do is plan ahead, let's schedule it. And if we schedule it, we agree, then we 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 make it happen. So to answer now your question in a slightly different way, there's obviously a lot that I do, right? So running the organization uh, from an administrative point of view um, is, is on my desk. I've got a portfolio of clients that I serve um, in, as, as the person who is the lead in terms of the service that we're delivering to clients, and it's a fairly sizable portfolio. Um, I run some of our office uh, operations directly myself, um, I mean, I'm de facto the chief financial officer, if you like, over and above a few other responsibilities. Uh, I've, um, I mean, aside from PwC and everything that's happening there, um, um, I'm involved at my church as a deacon. I'm the president of the Cycling Association in Zambia. I'm a member of a few business associations. And at the same time, I've got a fairly young family as well to look forward to. So there's a lot happening. So for me, it's just about a discipline to make sure that I allocate or appropriate time to each or, to each and everything that I need to, to do and get done in a particular period. So of all of those, would you say you are a better father or are you a better country partner or are you a better cycling president? <laughs> like, cause, like, I feel like, because you can't have the same level of commitment across Everywhere. the board. Yeah, to get a point. Yeah. So do you feel like... I think I'm 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 a much more better father than I am yeah. a country manager. Uh, I've got a philosophy on that as well. My philosophy is that there are seasons in life, right? So there are seasons even at work. There are seasons uh, in cycling. There are seasons in family. There are seasons, right? So I'll give you an example because they are all interlinked, okay, to some extent. Uh, for me to be able to be a good father, I need to be able to provide for my children need to be able to to give them a comfortable life. For me to be um, effective at the cycling association, I need to devote some time. But the way that these things work is that there are seasons, right? So there are times 
in the year where I have to be uh, extremely engaged at work beyond even normal hours, right? We are, we are doing this today. When we're done, I need to go to, to the office, right? It's, sometimes it's normal to, to work on a weekend, just a standard Saturday, Sunday, 9 p.m. every day. That's what it demands at that time, all right? What I'm doing at that time is enabling my children's lifestyle. It's, to a certain extent, even some of the other things I do because sometimes I'm, I need to use some of my own resources, for example, to sort out what's happening in cycling, all right? There are seasons when it's not this busy uh, at work, all right? At that point, I'm, I make sure that uh, I scale back. I'm only in the office when I need to be, 5 p.m., I'm done. If I don't need to work on the weekend, I won't. I spend that time investing with the kids and things like that. Any day when I can get off early to help out with the homework and things like that, I do that. I'm fortunate to have uh, my and my wife, quite, um, quite extremely helpful, fantastic spouse who helps. We, we share some of the responsibilities. But there are seasons, right? So the first three months of the year... Um, I even make sure all the stakeholders are fully aware. This is what the demands are on my time. When that subsides a bit, I mean, there's no cycling season and whatever. When the cycling season picks up, then it needs I need a bit more time there, a bit less here, where I can do some things with my kids or whatever. So I think the balance is not just that you must balance at all times, but to recognize that there are different seasons that come and go. And that's how my years are uh, the year the year is for me usually um so when when it's very in 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 professional firms like that we even have what's called busy season and you know you know what that means i've done 19 of them they they are all the same they've all had similar pressures although uh, as responsibilities have evolved it's also been different so that's how i think you balance all right so if 365 days of the year you work um 12 hours a day, something's going to give, right? And the way that it is with my view on seasons and the cycles thereof, at different times, there are different sacrifices being made. During the first three months of the year, I'm sacrificing some of the time that I'd like to spend with my kids. When that subsides, um, then I'll, I'll make sure I'm giving them the right level of attention. And kids, you know how they are. They grow very quickly, so... Um, you need to maximize all of the opportunities. There are certain basic things I don't miss. For example, the school run in the morning, I must do. It's a fantastic time. Interact, you have conversations. Whenever I can get home early, I do. Fridays, Saturdays, I've got dedicated time, um, especially when it's not raining. Sundays, we go, we cycle together, things like that. So you do different things, and when you put them together, hopefully you're able to give each dimension of life the attention that it requires for a particular season. How, how old is your marriage? 12 years. 12 years. Yeah, 13 this year. 13 this year. Okay. Um, wh what would you say has really held your marriage together? What values have, you know, really kept it going? And I'm asking this because um, at your level of success, we've seen what happens most of the time. Mm. You know, men then will do these, you know, mm -hmm. uh, immoral things, you then, oh, side cheek, what, what, mm -hmm. what? Because now all of a sudden you have got money, you know, <laughs> and then people become irresponsible and whatnot. But you, you, you are holding it together. Um, your Christian values are still intact. You are equally succeeding. Um, you're not loyal because you've got no money. Mm -hmm. You get the point, eh? So mm -hmm. with all these things, you still have held it together. What values do you feel have really made it possible for your marriage to still rock on? So first, I, I don't forget where we've come, where we came from. All right. So I met my wife some uh, that was Zika, so maybe twenty-two years ago. Um, and trust me, there was uh, my rap was weak. <laughs> um, I wasn't very successful in that department, but she became a friend of mine and she's a friend of mine, a very close friend of mine, my best friend basically. And so friendship is, is very important, right? So that was the, basically the foundation and that's the foundation that continues to, 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 to build on, um, from here. Uh, we developed, um, together, I spent two years away, 
uh, on secondment. This is interesting. One day I'll write a book about long distance relationships. I mean, the people doing long distance relationships yeah. now have it easy with this FaceTime and whatever. <laughs> I mean, we were apart for, for two years. Those days there was no... You didn't have your social media as active as it you is. You call it stop time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I used to used to call daily, uh, send photos daily. So we actually bought each other. I bought cameras too. So you take a picture, you send. How is my suit looking today? You send things like that. <laughs> so some very basic things just to keep it going. Um, uh, we we have a common faith, which is very important. I think that's 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 helped uh, to keep us going. Uh, the love continues to grow stronger. We try and have fun, I think, um, as 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 much as as much as possible, and uh, make life interesting to a great extent. But it's built on friendship, uh, a common understanding of what we're trying to do, uh, the goals and objectives that we've set. Uh, we complement each other very well, I think. Uh, we have to ask her that. Uh, at least that's my view. Right? <laughs> 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 but uh, it grows, and you know, like. Uh, Relationships grow, your marriage grows, you go through different uh, different periods, you learn from them, you grow, and you move on. All right. Yeah. Uh, back to social media. Uh, you, 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 you wrote once um, an article about uh, dealing with failure uh, in Definitely. reference to your, to, your, to, your, to your failed bid for Zika president in 2017. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What, what lessons did you learn from there? Uh, because most people, when they experience failure, mm-hmm. that's a chapter of their life that they want to shut and never look mm-hmm. back on, never mm-hmm. talk about it, never, never, you know. And they deny themselves a chance to learn. Yeah. Um, but it's something that you openly talk about, you know. What, what did you learn about failing? Because at, at that point, I feel, I feel like you, you, you strike me as one of those people who are not very familiar with failure, you know. On, on the contrary, me, failure is a friend of mine. And I'm very accustomed to, I, I don't know, in fact, uh, mentors of mine who've worked with me tell me I'm too hard on myself. Because when something doesn't go according to plan, I don't usually say, I don't, you know, mourn about it or cry about it, but I will take time to dissect it. Okay. What happened? Why? What could I have done better? I mean, even when, even when things go according to plan, I still do that. So I still ask the question, what could I have done better? Even when... Perhaps the desired result has been achieved. So for me, assessing, I mean, I did a lot of, even in that, a lot of consultations, you know, going back to people who were observing the process, guys, what could we have done differently? What do you think, et cetera. But lessons generally is that it, it was interesting because it's a competitive process, right? So it's when you've got your own piece of work that you're doing, a lot of it is within your control. Now you're dealing with, an environment where it's not necessarily all within your control because it was it's a it's a competition. You have to convince uh, people as to your ideas. Others are set in their ways, no matter what you say, uh, to try and convince them. But as a learning, um, it it was filled with learnings. A around um, just uh, uh, you know being alive to different preferences and uh, and and people's views there is also a bit of politics right that you see that whatever happens even nationally is it, it, it society is a reflection of uh, of, uh, of of what what you see nationally is simply a reflection of what happens even in small societies and I'm, and and it's just the fact that look no matter what you do some people they will not um, accept you Right, no matter how good you think your ideas are, how well thought out they are, how you've presented them, obviously it's for them to judge, right? So I'm not saying I had I had necessarily have the best ideas. I thought I had good ideas, right? But the people judge and said, actually, we think this is we need something different at this time. So being alive to that fact, look, you're not always in control of your outcomes, even when you think you've put in. A uh, fairly strong um, uh, position. Um, that there are positives even in those um, situations. Uh, I didn't realize. I mean, prior to that, I probably wasn't. I mean, I was. I was probably visible, but not that visible in some respects. 
um, visit. I didn't lose. I didn't win, but I got quite a lot of uh, people patting me on the back for 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 a great effort. Right? I'm like, oh, okay. So it's possible to not win, but still win in some respects because the relationships which were forged. Um, a lot of um, contacts and connections and things like that. So irrespective of the circumstances, there's always, and if you saw, there's a, there's another post I put out at some point about always looking for silver linings. That's what I always do. So what are the silver linings here? I've learned a great deal about people. I've interacted with people. Because, I mean, there are people I've had never met today. They are people I can call. And I first met them when I was campaigning. Hi, my name is Andrew Chibri. I'm, I'm campaigning for presidency of the Accounting Institute. Could I have five minutes of your time? Uh, yes, no. Yes, okay, no. So, And then you start trying to engage them. Those are some people uh, perhaps to this day I wouldn't have interacted with. So plenty of positives, definitely. And uh, you, you keep learning and moving. All right, away from failure and talking about negatives, have you ever had to fire someone? Yes. How do you... Talk me through how, how that has to work. Like, <laughs> how does the conversation go? There's no one way of doing it. First and foremost, um, there, are different, there are different dynamics, right? When you are an employer or you have the responsibility, all right, of, um, of managing people's performance, their careers, etc. okay? Now, the way that I believe it should work is that if someone is being let go of, First and foremost, you're sensitive that it's not, it's it's not an easy thing, right, for them in terms of what to do next. But even for you, as a, because look, we are all people first, okay. So you can't help but put yourself in the person's situation, in the person's shoes, right, when they have those uh, those sorts of uh, um, when you have to have such a conversation. But first and foremost, it should never come as a surprise, especially when it's a performance issue. Because and that's usually the, the 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 hedge for me is that look you have to manage performance on an ongoing basis not something that you do at the end of the year and someone is surprised about the outcomes right so there has to be an ongoing process where people are aware of how they are trending what that what what they need to do and more importantly what are the potential outcomes positive or negative. Negative, obviously, potentially being even being terminated. But then you you then also over the years I've come to realize different things. Eh? So first and foremost, there are situations where you know from day one someone is considered um, non-performing, all right, or they've got challenges from the first day, and this is something that any employer may want to think about, right? So you hire someone from the first day, there's a problem. Okay, or there's a challenge, or from early on you can notice challenges. Then you ask yourself a question: Okay, did we perhaps recruit the wrong person? And they could be. It's not that they are not capable of succeeding somehow. It's just that perhaps they're in the wrong environment. Okay, some environments are not for everyone. Okay, so you come to that acceptance. Now, if, for example, that is not the case, then you have a situation where. Different scenarios where you have someone who is they are performing very well, then their performance is very poor. Maybe they're inconsistent, right? Then the task for you is to try and figure out, okay, what is it perhaps that is causing this inconsistency? All right, is there something I can do to alleviate or remove those factors which are causing this seesaw type of performance? All right, if you can. Well and good, deal with it. Some of the best experiences I've had personally are turning people's performance around where someone was clearly underperforming. You have some interventions. In a few months or weeks' time, they are flying. That is, that is, there is nothing which comes close to that when it comes to people management, for me personally, turning the performance of underperformers around, right? And the others, perhaps, um, interests have changed, et cetera, et cetera. But being able to understand if it's a perform if it's performance, understanding what's the performance issue, how do you remediate it, how do we move forward, that's that. The other situations where someone has done, you know, there the are some grave offenses, right, whether it's, um, it's an, an issue with 
non-compliance or an ethical issue and whatnot. And even in those situations, the goal is always, even as you are um, uh, dealing with someone, they go away and they still have a life else, elsewhere. And there have been many people. They leave, we have a conversation, they leave, and they're flying in their next life. And then you say to yourself, actually, perhaps... It's just they're better suited elsewhere. Yeah, just do them a favor. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> I didn't put it like that. You have to be diplomatic. Obviously. Yeah. Um, also, you talked about, you know, um, young people making it count. Yeah. Um, you know, um, in, in, in their places of work. And earlier we talked about the, the young graduates that jo- join organizations. Yeah. Um, but let's talk about young people in general. Mm. Here's a young person. They join an organization. It can be PwC or anywhere else. Mm. How do they begin to make it count from day one? How do they become very intentional about their career progression, Mm -hmm. about their personal development? Mm -hmm. Because um, clarity is power. If I'm not clear about where I want to go, then I won't be surprised if I find myself anywhere. Mm -hmm. How do I achieve that? I think you even answered the question, Sui. So the first thing is you have to understand how this organization works. All right. So let's assume you've gone into an organization, the culture fit is right, so it's the right place for you. Um, the organization is also, you know, like yeah, yeah, a fish in water, right? You're a fish and you've been put in water and not on land. Let's use that sort of analogy, right? So then you have to start analyzing. So you have to then understand what is it that makes a, this organization tick and what is it that makes people who tick in this organization tick. All right, so there's obviously there's the culture. Organizations have got values. Organizations have got uh, targets. They've got expectations. They've got uh, obligations as well. I can sp- there are different types of organizations, but maybe let me talk for organizations such as ours, okay, which are typically what you'd call high performance organizations, okay, where you're constantly looking for improvement. There are huge demands on your time. You're expected to go above and beyond a standard, sometimes with with no additional recognition, right? So organizations like mine, if I'm out and I ask someone else to sit in for me, there's no acting allowance, for example. It's, allowance. What do you mean? <laughs> it's just part of your responsibilities. Yeah, that, that's that's how it is. And and <laughs> it 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 may be strange in some organizations, but in organizations like ours, that's just how it works. You work an hour or two extra here. You may not need get necessarily get paid overtime for each and every overtime hour that you work. It's expected, right? That's the culture of the organization. In other organizations, it's different, right? So you understand all of that. What makes it tick? What makes people tick, etc. And then from there, I think it's it's about a journey of constant improvement. All right. So once you understand how. Uh, being of value in an organization is perceived, then it's about how you how you position yourself as that sort of individual. So, for example, organizations like ours, which are not which is a knowledge organization, right? We are called in to offer advice because we are perceived as knowing a thing or two more than the organization itself. That is um, that that requires a very deliberate effort in terms of what it is that we focus on, whether it's uh, the type of um, studies we acquire, the research that we do, um, our network, and what we are able to to get in terms of expertise. We have certain expertise that the market or clients are keen to engage. So it's about building that expertise. It's about understanding. Okay, I'm joining today. What what's topical? What's relevant? Not just today, but what's also emerging? Right. What uh, we we get paid because we help clients to solve problems or solve uh, issues that they have. What issues is the client likely to have this year, next year? Uh, how do we position ourselves to be able to answer some of those challenges that they have? Simple. There is now um, issues with currency volatility here and there. A, a, a client of ours who is who is a significant importer may be having problems with sustaining their operations because it's difficult to plan, all right? Are you the guy who understands how foreign currency markets work and you can go in and give them some guidance on how they manage some of that risk so that they're able to remain sustainable? It's things like that. So it's really how you read read your organization, read the people there, understand 
what's expected and how you, you deliver and how you continue to evolve. So you have to continue to evolve because what was topical and relevant yesterday may not be topical or relevant today, let alone tomorrow. So that's really what it's about. Um, relevance. All right. Continue to be relevant. I, I want us to talk about adjusting. Um, also in reference to evolving, like you mentioned. Yeah. You said organizations like yours are go, go, go. It's fast performance. How can I say what I want to adjust? You know, I'm yeah. from Ministry of Agriculture, you know, yeah. or I was from Ministry of Religious Affairs, whatever government organization yeah. I was from. And I joined PwC. Yeah. It's a different ball game altogether. You know, mm-hmm. and because most people say, ah, you won't last. And, and that's what they, they tell themselves. <laughs> people in quasi-government organizations, people in actual government organizations, um, generally people in the civil service, mm-hmm. it's perceived that you won't last in the private sector because mm-hmm. you're coming from um, this space which is, you know, perceived as laissez-faire, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's just relaxed, you know. Now you go there and you should be there at 7th, out at... And then, the, so how, how how does one adjust? I'm not sure because I think that that's a is a blanket statement, right? Because every organ, every environment has got people who underperform and those who outperform. I've been to many government departments and been pleasantly surprised at the service I've received. Right? So, wow, this is possible. So it goes back to the initial statements we made about attitude and aptitude. I've got, uh, we've got people who work with us who started off in, in government. And they're doing fine. Attitude, aptitude. So even when we talk about, say, the public service and, and what's the, the public service has obviously developed a reputation, right? But it's not every, each and every individual in the, you work in the public service, right? <laughs> so not every, not, uh, you know, it's like where you paint the entire sector with, uh, with, with, with one brush, right? So, the individual has obviously got an, um, um, a key part to play, their own attitude and aptitude. When you understand the organization, all right, what is it that you perceive as, because what, what you perceive as perhaps lethargy or whatever, some of it could simply be because of the way the organization is structured, the bureaucracy, who makes a decision or whatever. That can be separate from the individual themselves. In our organizations, we expect you where you are to make a decision. In, in the civil service, perhaps an individual may not be empowered to the same degree and the outcome is that perception or that result, right? So it really does come down to just the individual in terms of their own view, irrespective of, of where they are. I'm sure there are people who say they've come to our organization and have, have had an experience which is less than expected, Right. Even if we are in the private sector, in what I've defined as a high-performing organization, that is just the nature of how it is. So it comes down to the individuals and that that fundamental bit around their attitude and their aptitude. All right. Earlier, we talked about clarity. Um, and in one of your postings, you talked about um, being clear about your short-term, medium-term, and long-term career career goals and plans. Yeah. Um, let's try and break them down Um to an average, you know, professional, someone in trying to build a career, what would you classify as these should be your short-term goals? Like short-term. What, what would be someone's short-term goals? Typically what you want to get achieved in a year. That's what I think. So, um, I mean, there's no, now that you ask me, there's no probably exact science, but if I just take my own, let me, let me use me as an example, right? Yeah. When I to- talk short-term goals, I'm talking about, the year, okay? So in the year, for example, 2023, what do I want to achieve in 2023? Because then what I'm doing um, on a monthly basis, on a daily basis, is sort of helping me to, to, to plug in what I'm supposed to do in the year. Then when I talk medium term, you're probably looking at maybe two to five years, you know, my next promotion, my next career grade, uh, my next adjustment in terms of responsibility, which is an aggregation of what I'm doing on an annual basis, right? So where do I want to be? By by five years, where do I want to be? Typically for me. Then long term is like, I want to be the CEO, I want to be the, 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 the country senior partner, whatever it is that you, wherever you think your career end point is. That's how I sort of define it. Would you, would, you, would, you, would, you, would you advise someone to make their intentions known in the organization? So 
make it obvious. Everyone should know that uh, Andrew is looking for promotion, you know, or should you keep your cards to yourself lest they sabotage your plans? <laughs> it depends. <laughs> In our organization, you, it, you're expected to make them known. In other organizations, perhaps maybe the, the, the role you're aspiring for, there's only one person and that's your supervisor. You would inadvertently be telling them, "I'm looking for your job." <laughs> <laughs> so, I guess you need to you need to be you need to be uh, alive to the 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 realities of your particular environment. But notwithstanding, there are certain things that you need to that I think every person can think about, and that is look. If we start with the the assumption that people are looking to grow, right? Perhaps there are some who are not. They're happy, comfortable with doing what they do. But even there, there should be growth. Because even if you do the same thing every day, hopefully you should be doing the same thing. You should be improving how you do it, right? Technology, whatever, there's always opportunities to do things better. Okay? So we start with that assumption that everyone is looking to grow in one way, shape, or form. Then, like in my organization, expected to define what I've told you, we expect you to define. In high-performance organizations, it's not unusual at all. In other organizations as well, I think at a certain point, especially after, um, because I think after a certain point, especially when you've proved yourself, you've demonstrated your value to, to the organization and the business, you earn the right to... To, to make certain statements, to 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 make make certain demands, and why not, right? Or at least, if not say this is what I'm aspiring for, you can ask the question, what next for me? And if you are a valuable, if you're an asset to the business, then the business has to think about how they 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 help you achieve your growth objective. So I think it really depends in terms of how um, explicit you are about your goals. Working towards them, definitely improving and growing, definitely um, definitely needed. Um, and then you sort of progress from there. Okay. Um, you also had uh, done a post about being flexible. Yeah. Could you, could you tell me about a time um, in your career where you had to show flexibility? <laughs> now this sounds like an interview. <laughs> this is also, it, it is an interview, right? No, this is an interview question. This, <laughs> <laughs> this is an actual interview question. But I would like to know because, yeah. look, it's, it's one thing to tell someone be flexible, but, but yeah. give me an example. Yeah. What does flexibility look flexibility like? Flexibility look like, yeah. So flexibility is basically about, and, and that's, uh, even this is relevant even to the previous question because sometimes if you're in an organization and say there's only one way up, it may be that for you to grow, you may need to take a detour, right? Maybe yeah. do something different. So I mean plenty, flexibility all the time, Right. Um, being called, and it's basically being asked to do things that perhaps you're not necessarily, um, it's not your primary responsibility, that's one way. I mean, I'll tell you, I, for the longest time, I probably developed as a, someone with an interest and a focus on the financial sector, right? Uh, banking specifically, and I invested a lot of time in it. And at some point, I had to take on some responsibilities, especially in the public sector and things like that. And you just get on with it, right? And that's the thing. It's a new experience. You learn, you adapt, you grow. If there's a, there's a learning process, which is the same, irrespective of which industry or what role you're being given, is what's expected of me? How am I supposed to do it? How can I do this properly? Who are the stakeholders? What are the expectations? Um, uh, what tools do I need to be able to deliver? Which people do I need to engage? When you look at it like that, actually, you find there's very little that you are not able to to do and achieve because you've got that capability and capacity. So yeah, play flexibility all the time. In fact, can I tell you something about these posts? If you ask my wife, she'll tell you. She whispers to me sometimes, you're just writing about yourself, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, in one way, for a lot of them, it's yeah, just I mean, my what, own. What do you know better than yourself? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so a lot, of it is, a lot of it is actually just my own learnings and experiences. When I say be flexible, I was probably reflecting on a time where I needed to be quite flexible. Mm. Okay. Or the other in, uh, the, okay, actually, let me give you a, 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 another interesting one. So for the longest time, I was a 
perfectionist, right? I want things done this way, my way, and that's it, okay? And then um, that's how I came through, right? When I do a piece of work, I would even go on to <laughs> one of the managers I used to work as I have done my report. I challenge you to come up with any review comments. I mean, he still would, but that's that was just my attitude, right? And I carried the same along. Now, it was easy to do when I had very, just a handful of my own clients. And then as you get more responsibility, it starts to expand, and it's not always possible to replicate yourself in your team, all right? So now someone gives you something. They've written what they should write, but they haven't written they haven't presented it or written it the way you would you would have done it yourself all right mm -hmm. now there would be times early on in my career i just start writing it again all right mm -hmm. and then you come and find you you're spending hours and hours and hours dealing with things which are just they were okay it's just not your style it's different so over time it's something that i started to adapt to so look it's fine. It doesn't have to be the way I would, exactly the way I would have done it, I would have wanted it. Have we communicated the right messages? Is the format uh, correct? Have we captured the gist of what needed to be captured? If that's the case, ah, it's fine. Let's move on. So that's something where over time I've, I've evolved and I think I'm quite flexible now. All right. Um, and th th there are some times with people where you, you are in this organization, right? Mm -hmm. And you feel like you're not appreciated, you're not valued. And this one day you decide to say, you know what, I'm going to leave. Mm -hmm. Then the day I'm going to leave, then they offer you, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. more yeah. money or here, more perks. <laughs> yeah. would, would you advise someone like that to stay? Oh, it depends, man. That's, that's, a, that's a difficult one. It's a difficult one. Um, I know people who've stayed and been happy. I know people who've stayed and been unhappy um, in different environments. What I would say, and this is from the, um, because there's different perspectives here. There's an employer's perspective and then there's the employee's perspective. As far as possible, there should be no ambiguity in an individual's growth path. Okay. So from an employer's point of view, one of my responsibilities is to minimize ambiguity. So that someone knows this is where you are today. To get to where you want to get to next, this is what you must do. Uh, this is what you need to work on. Move. Such that um, when they're getting to that point or if they fall short or I tell them you are not ready, there's no surprise to them. But this is easier said than done, right? It's a... It's a bit, it can even be a bit theoretical in some places. But from a cultural perspective, it's just easier. When people get to a point where they say, I want to leave, okay, there's different things either. And you are telling them things that they have not been told before. It's a very difficult conversation. That's one thing I can tell you because everyone is entitled to ask, but why didn't you tell me this? before and usually when people have had that conversation, when they come and tell you I'm leaving, it means they've already had a conversation elsewhere, they've been uh, sold the dream, they've been persuaded so how do you then uh, get them to change their mind simply with what you're doing so it's usually a sign that there's some communication which hasn't happened when it should have but advice outright, that's a difficult one because it depends, in some organizations maybe they're genuine, there's there's some factors maybe which are outside their control. They can't confirm to you. Now it's that you're saying you're leaving. It's imperative. They can confirm to you. So it's a, it's one of those it depends type of questions. All right. Um, you shared the CV some time back. Yeah. Um, very, very interesting thing that I saw on it. Um, you've worked in, ish, I don't I, I can't even count the countries. Yeah. Um, in Botswana, in Swatini, Kenya, Nigeria, Rwanda, South Africa, Tanzania, the UAE, the UK, and obviously here in Zambia. From working in these different environments, different mm -hmm. cultures and whatnot, how did you still still stay relevant, you know, in, in different countries? Because again, um, it's easier to work in your country because yeah. you understand the culture, you understand mm -hmm. the people, you understand what's expected. 
in a new environment before you settle here or oh, you've moved to another country? <laughs> so those were, they were projects. So it's not like you're going there. I mean, you go there for a short period of time, not like you're, the way I spent a long time was the UK. The others you go, um, you do a particular, a particular project. Now, the reason why you're going there for a particular project is that they need your skills, right? So that's the starting point. You're not just, you just haven't, you just haven't appeared there and all of a sudden you're being asked to do something. There's, there's a process. Uh, we think Andrew is the right person to come and do this this particular piece of work, and you, you go. With firms like ours, um, it's slightly easier because the culture is similar, the expectations are similar, no matter where you go, and the way we do things, so the tools and systems we use are similar. What's different is the... Um, the, the the exact work, so the client that you're going to, or the piece of work that you're going to be doing uh, may be different, uh, and also, say, just the general culture in terms of what's happening there. But you come and find, generally, the positives or the, the uniting factors usually far outweigh those that are subtracting. And actually, even those which are you aren't familiar with, for me, it's a huge learning experience. You see it, you observe, you learn, you understand the culture, it's 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 a great learning experience. So those things which are different for me are positives because I'm learning something new. Okay, so when I'm in the UAE, this is how things are done. When I'm in Nigeria, this is how things are done. When I'm in South Africa, this is how things are done. This is how you engage. This is how you things are, are perceived and how you do them. So that's that's how I, I generally perceive it, and it's been a, a fairly um, significant positive. In terms of in terms of the overall work experience, but it's really about focusing on the task. I mean, I've gone there because there's a certain capability that I have. In some of those, I've been a, a team leader. So you're going into a different environment, and you're working with a team that's coming from different parts of the world, even. All right. So you focus on what unites and what brings everyone together, and get the task done. All right. Really fairly time bound. You did your your your. Um... Your, your, your MBA at uh, Manchester Business School, yeah. then you went to Oxford Brooks, um, you did um, applied accounting um, mm-hmm. there. These are like additional qualifications above your ACCA, Correct. you know. Um, so basically, go do your master's outside. My question is going to be, um, as an employer, do you feel it matters where someone did their master's? So I have you have an MBA from Manchester Business School. Mm-hmm. I have an MBA from a local university. Mm-hmm. You interview these people. Are you going to say, let's get this guy because this guy went to Manchester <laughs> Business School? Um, the way that I see it... Okay, so there's a story to each of my qualifications. So it was very deliberate in terms of why I did what I did when I did, right? So there's no, there's, it wasn't by accident. I just say, let me go and do this. But obviously, the, because when you're looking at a, a qualification, you look at its credibility, right? So obviously, it counts. But as long as a, an institution is credible, then that should be fine, right? We recruit our biggest source of recruit, I mean, recruit from CPU, from Unza, from, from, um, from, from Zikas and, and, internationally as well right so it's important that we because that's that's just the way that that uh, that it all works you put on your cv that you've got a qualification from x y and z organization or university there's a perception that's formed but as long as the institutions are considered credible and most of them i mean they've got a number of credible institutions in zambia it's fine we recruit from international recruit from local the way that we our process works, we put everyone through the same process. And it tells us a lot more than just what your academic degree says with the sorts of tools and techniques that are there, if you think about psychometrics, etc. We get a lot more information about even your ability to fit in our organization than we do just from looking at your CV and, and where, where you got your qualifications from. So it's a bit of a balancing act. It's not... Um, cast in stone, uh, everyone gets a fair chance. But there's just that car, that car upper advantage. There's always, but but think about it, right? What different individuals come from different backgrounds, all right? Uh, some are able to, to go to a Harvard or a Princeton. Obviously, they'll come, they'll have some, some, 
the, it, it goes without saying. There's some brand value that's ascribed to them in the process. Well and good. Someone may not have had the opportunity to go there, but doesn't necessarily mean they're not capable of doing what they need to do, which is why, for example, in a holistic recruitment process, you have to try and get to the person as well, right? So attitude, for example, for me is more important than aptitude as a starting point. So how do you evaluate that aspect so that you then have, you almost have like an equalizer across these different factors? Okay, yes, yes, you may have uh, studied at the world's most premier uh, organization, but are you a, is is your attitude are you are you the right is your view on things consistent with how we view things are are you the right fit for our organization? I'll tell you, for example, I have interviewed a number of people, you know, from best universities, graduated uh, with distinction, and um, it's clear when you are talking to them that these people. Only their opinion matters, right? You can find people, very opinionated people or people who find it hard to take advice from people, from other people, right? Or who find it hard to work with, with others, right? It's very easy to do that as an experienced interview. And you can conclude, well, whereas this person has a fairly strong academic performance from a more, very reputable organization, clearly they can't work with other people or they've got a problem working in teams, and for us to for them to be successful here, they have to be able to work as a team player. So sorry, regret. And they get very shocked. And they even come back very aggressively, finding out how is it that I couldn't have made it. I said, Have you seen this <laughs> this attitude? That's it's a reason. In there. Mm-hmm. As we come to an end, uh, Mr. Chiwe, what would be the five things you would like to say to young people, especially those in the professional space? Five. Okay, let's see. So I think the first thing is, um, so you need to be clear with what you're, where you are going and what you want to achieve, right? Because it can't be an accident. And for me, when you set out what you want to do, how you want to do it, when you want to do it, by when you want to do it, it then starts to inform even how you work towards it, right? The, the passion that you apply, how deliberate you are, the opportunities that you look for. So being clear, I think that's one. Number two is um, obviously being dynamic. So for me, that's the question of being relevant. Huh? So looking at how do you continue to adapt? We've talked about that. Adapt, flexible. Uh, I've seen people say, no, I trained as... Um, an engineer, I can't be asked to do something outside of this. Hey, look, all the skills are positive. Um, your academic is just a, it's a stepping stone. It's a platform. It's a key that opens a door. What you may actually end up doing may be different, right? It's apply, about applying your skill set to a set of problems and you move forward. That's what uh, you'll be looking to. Um, number three... I guess is um, continuous improvement, right? Continuous improvement. So continuing to evolve, continue to improve. What have I done? How can I do it better? How, what have I done and failed to do? What lessons have I learned from there? And how do I uh, improve uh, from there? I think well, the one thing I, I forgot about in point two about being dynamic is really looking at what is emerging at the moment. What does it mean for me? You almost have to look at yourself as an organization or as a business. You know, you have your own strategic plan. And how is what is happening around you affecting where you go and move? Uh, then I think being being um, visible is very important as well. Eh? Um, and in this respect, uh, it's a competitive world. It's... It's a, a place where there's so many different things which are competing for attention. So how do you stand out, right? And I always tell people standing out or going the extra mile doesn't always necessarily have to be work-related, right? So for example, everyone can be equally um, 
at, at an equal footing and e an even keel when it comes to doing a particular piece of work. But the, org the needs of the organization are bi maybe bigger than strictly just delivering on clients. We, I need someone to help us run our CSR program, to do our school outreach, etc. All those are opportunities for greater visibility to do something different um, over and above uh, what you would uh, ordinarily. And I guess the last one is to work hard, right? So there's no point. You can have an elaborate plan. You can be dynamic, uh, flexible. Move, uh, flexible, all these sorts of things. By the end of the day, you need to put some real skin in the game and push, push hard uh, and keep pushing. Yeah, that's what I would say. Thank you, Mr. Chiwe. Uh, Thank so you. So you, you, you are on social media. Um, yeah. Um, it's Andrew L. Chibui on Facebook, right? On Facebook, yes. Um, yeah. You are an even bigger star on, on LinkedIn. LinkedIn, yeah. <laughs> That's strange. You know, about. people people always ask, like, like, so what do you guys do on LinkedIn? <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, can I tell you something about this? Eh? Uh, to, nowadays, because I've been on Facebook for so long, eh, it's rare that I'll get a friend request from someone I know on Facebook. You know what I mean? Because, I mean, all my, like, mates, the people that I know personally, over the course of I don't know how many years I've been on Facebook, they're probably added somewhere in my actual yeah. friends list. Eh? But I do a, some, something simple now. When someone sends me a friend's request on Facebook and I've got a bit of time, the first thing I go and do is check if they're on LinkedIn. So if I find someone who's sending me a Facebook request and they're not on LinkedIn, I say, this person really... I mean, how can you not be on LinkedIn? I mean, that's at least my thinking because LinkedIn is where uh, professionals, businesses... And there's a lot happening there. Uh, I need to be right. So that's a step by the way. For most people, they're on LinkedIn because they're looking for jobs. Yeah, but there's, you can do a lot more on LinkedIn than just look for jobs. Yeah, because I think most Zambians. I think there's one time I posted about LinkedIn. Most Zambians have got no idea what to do on LinkedIn oh. because people are saying no. LinkedIn is just where people brag. No, he's 23 with three masters. <laughs> what and what? So we, we feel, you know, they just feel threatened. Just no. log out. Can I tell you, um, LinkedIn? Well, yeah. So I don't know. Unless perhaps you went to study and you did your schooling and you don't want a job or you don't want business opportunities, maybe you can tell us that it's not a relevant site. I mean, obviously, Facebook has got some of those capabilities. But if you think about recruiters and things like that, even me, sometimes I sit and just peruse people's profiles. Hey, this, this profile looks... We, they haven't even so when you, when you go to a profile, what are you looking for? Yeah, what they do. Um, so obviously, the qualifications are interesting. What experience they have, what passion they have, um, what they're talking about. If they're talking about stuff, and sometimes you take a snapshot, you take a snip, you send to HR. Say, HR, this one looks interesting, and you find you get an unsolicited phone call from an HR department. I spoke previously about being visible, right? Where are you going to be visible? Um, in a lot of instances, yeah, it's it's probably uh, you you stand a better chance of catching my attention on LinkedIn than you do will in person, right? Because to be in person, you have to be where I am. If you've got a, a strong LinkedIn profile and you know how to grab people's attention online, you have a chance on link. You have a stronger chance on LinkedIn than in person. Yeah, I think uh, people need a LinkedIn masterclass so they can really <laughs> appreciate. Um, yeah, but the downside also is you find this person on, on LinkedIn, very serious guy. Yeah. Go to Facebook, they're a joker. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's no consistency. Uh, and, and you see that a lot. No, but, well, people are also different, right? So one person can have different dynamics. As long as it's constructive stuff, uh, it's fine. It's where people are offensive or they don't know how to conduct themselves on social media that becomes interesting because now it's possible to I, I had this great I know we were, we're wrapping up and eh? I had this interesting experience so the same thing you're talking about about a different person on Facebook and on LinkedIn eh? yeah so I can't remember what I posted about on Facebook and that someone actually vulgar in my eh, on the comments and for whatever reason, I because it doesn't often happen, and I, I noted them. I said, okay, fine, this is their opinion. And then, like, years later, they sent me their CV on LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Okay, so now help, wanting help with a job. And I was convinced it must be the person. And I went back and I looked, and it was actually the same person. So what do I do? <laughs> 
because they they've already conducted their job interview simply by saying, look, when we have a difference of opinion in views, I cannot articulate myself in a constructive manner, even if we agree to disagree. Obviously, I'm not going. Yeah, no, no, I'm obviously not going to. I'm not going to employ you. So people don't see that aspect of social media. So when I've tried, there was a time I, I made a post. If you have nothing constructive to say, say nothing, because in in a few years, in fact, it's already happening. Job adverts will just be clicking a button, and an algorithm puts together your profile for us on social media. And we already know who you are based on what you do. So be careful what you put there. If you're going to put stuff out, make sure it's positive, make sure it's constructive. Otherwise, you'll find yourself disqualified because of the post you made. All right. So like I said, um, Facebook is Andrew L. Chibuye. Yep. Um, is the L also there on LinkedIn? Or no, no. Andrew Chibuye on LinkedIn. Andrew Chibuye on LinkedIn, on Instagram, and on Twitter. Ah, Andrew okay. L. Chibuye is also on YouTube. Yeah. Ah, okay, yeah, the YouTube channel as well. Um, so what should people expect from you this year? So quite a bit. Um... I've been, I think, been a fair, I've been fairly consistent this year. It's mainly just stuff about, so it's a lot of stuff around personal development, leadership. So th- this is it. Uh, it's about leadership, um, personal development, some motivation in there. Um, but also a big part of what I do is, you know, with things that happen, whether it's the economy, uh, it's try and simplify so that everyone can understand. So I'll be doing a lot more of that later in the year pick a topic or issue and just try and help people understand the common man understand all right thank you very much for gracing our presence thank you very much and uh, we look forward to more interactions thank you look forward to it all right thank you boss